your patience as we uh, move on with week six of our series in the Gospel Primer. So we're going to uh, be talking about two lenses today. All right, so let's open a word of prayer and we'll get started. Uh, Father, we thank you. We praise you for your goodness and your grace towards us. And we ask that you would be with us uh, as we look into your word tonight, Lord. And I pray that you would give us the understanding of your truth, and this understanding of your word, and God, we continue to thank you and praise you for all the things that you're doing in our lives. We pray this and submit it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we have been practicing, hopefully, uh, the gospel story, God's story, and also been practicing. Um, your gospel story. So, as always, we'll ask, is there a volunteer that would like to uh, either tell God's story, you know, kind of from creation all the way to uh, restoration, or even talk about your gospel story, your kind of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration? Any volunteer? I'll try God's story. God's story? Good. All right. Uh, God has always existed, and he has created everything including mankind. From man, he created woman, and he placed them in the Garden of Eden, a perfect place where they can live and multiply and be fruitful. Mm -hmm. However, um, Satan, coming in the form of a serpent, deceived Eve and called mankind to rebel against God. And as a result of that rebellion, God cast them out of out of. Uh, this perfect place he had created for them, and subject them to pain, death, and separation from him. That was the beginning of sin in this world. Sin continued to increase for over 2,000 years until God made a covenant with Abraham. And when he made this covenant with Abraham, he promised him that he would be the father of many nations. Um, God blessed the Israelites, and they continued to grow and increase until they, too, rebelled against God. But God, being sovereign, had a plan from the beginning to redeem, to rescue his people. So he promised the Savior would come. So he sent an angel to Mary to announce the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, who would come and save his people. Jesus came. Jesus lived on this earth for 33 years, calling men to follow after him, to follow after God's rule, to govern themselves after him. Jesus taught that eternal, the eternal kingdom is in the heart and that he alone is the one who um, possesses eternal life. I tell you, just, just so awesome. He alone possesses eternal life. And so Christ died on the cross, taking on our sins, taking on our penalty, giving us eternal life. He rose after three days with all power over sin and death. No. No. And he didn't leave us alone. He left the Holy Spirit to be with us, to lead us and to guide us in all truth. And Jesus promises to one day return. And when he returned, he is going to make all things new. He is going to rid this earth of sin, pain, and death. 
So what a, what a wonderful gift to look forward to. Developing a Servant's Heart, Discovering God's Blessing and Giving of Yourself by Charles Stanley. Oh, yes, so just yes. That, uh, be a blessing you. to you. Thank you. Thank All you. right. All right. Very good. Very good. So we want to continue, um, <laughs> yeah, rehearsing, understanding the flow, and then be able to understand and, and notice what a great message that is, especially in light of the fallenness of our world. You get another school shooting. You get another disaster. And you want to let people know that God is not absent. He is aware and he's coming back one day, and he will make everything the way it was supposed to be. And the reason why the world has fallen because of our rebellion. So it's a wonderful way when you know God's story that you can articulate it when people have questions, when things happen in our world today. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, last, last week, we, uh, I made some extra copies. If anyone didn't get one last week, we talked about the four G's, right? The four eternal truths about God. And we, we looked at this as a way to continue to help us to overcome sin when we believe these truths that God is great, so I don't have to be in control. God is glorious, so I don't have to fear others. God is good, so I don't have to look elsewhere for my satisfaction. And God is gracious, so I don't have to prove myself, right? So if we remember these four truths, right, uh, these eternal truths about God, that would help us to grow in our faith and our confidence about all the things that we're going through with this life, and we don't have to have these idols pop up, right, that we have to deal with. So take that, keep it somewhere. You know, I heard some, I saw some people posting, they were framing it, you know, they were putting it up on their refrigerator. So it's a good thing to, as a constant reminder uh, for us when we start to fall back into some things we struggle with, remind ourselves of these uh, eternal truths about God and keep preaching those things to ourselves. All right, so this week we're talking about the two gospels. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, sure. a quick question. You gave us some um, passages, basically to do one to three to read last time. Okay. You know, as part of the, the lessons about the power and, you know, and who God is. In reading Hebrews 1, um, I noticed that in the uh, New England and the uh, New International Version and English Standard Version, he, when it referred to Jesus, was not capitalized. Okay. In the King James Version, it is. So why I bring up this point is, you know, in, in my reading, you know, when I, when I want to know who you're talking about, you know, usually when we're talking about the special God, there's a capital H or M or whatever. But there wasn't in these two versions, but there wasn't in King James. And when I read the and I always read the NIV, the version that I, that I can understand that. When I read it, you know, and I was, so I wasn't sure why that was. I was pretty sure about who we were talking about. I guess as we read through, I just want to know, is there, is there, when we see this, is there some kind of difference of, as we try to interpret this stuff? Or yeah, no. Is that significant as long as we understand it, which Right, right. It's really not. It's not the why. Why one translator decided not to capitalize the pronouns? Um, it's probably just a choice of the translators that they do. They, you know, I've seen that in a lot of writings. That even even people who write today on blogs and stuff, they don't always capitalize when referring to God the pronouns. So, well, but we, uh, in the in the context of it, and you know, we can just say we know who we're talking about, and we can just right, right. You should be able to hopefully right. discern based on. The context is you read it, who is the he that, you know, yeah. uh, without that visual aid necessarily. Exactly. I guess from my understanding, you know, someone on it, Jesus Christ, God, Holy Spirit, want to make sure I understand, so I understand sure. that. Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I personally like to capitalize it myself when I write my sermon. Yeah, yeah, well, it makes it easier for me, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't want to be interpreted too much. Okay, all right. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Good question. All right, so... You remember, well, those of you that are old enough, uh, if you were alive in the 50s, remember when 3D movies uh, 3D movies started coming out, right? When they were first introduced, right, uh, you had to wear these little glasses, uh, you know, and, you, and let's be honest, probably the visual effects probably wasn't that stunning, no. right, you know, uh, so uh, they were more novel, you know, it's like, okay, this is cute, this is interesting, right? Uh, but now, 
if you do three D movies now, I don't know how many of you like three D movies, right? It costs a little extra, so I don't, you know, I don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> you asked me to spend more money, I'm like, I don't, need to like I, I don't need to see stuff coming at me. If you just give it to me at the normal price. That's his well, <laughs> yeah, no, even then, even then, <laughs> y'all know hashtag <laughs> frugal. Uh, <laughs> yeah, spent too much already, but uh, <laughs> but it is though if you do. If you do, the, the 3D technology is pretty spectacular, right? But you realize that you have to wear the glasses, right? You need both lenses in, because have, have you ever gone to one that, this is, I see kids do that, if I take my kids up, but we happen to go to one, you know, they're taking it, they're taking it off just so they can see what does it look like, right? Mm -hmm. Without them, and they put them back on, right? And because without wearing them, the film, you know, if you have one lens in and one out, right? The film is going to look distorted, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to look like what the director had in mind, right? So that's what the gospel is like, right? The gospel, in some ways, are, is like that. That we we can read the Bible a couple of ways. We can read the Bible thematically through a theme lens, or we can read it as a story through the lens of a story. And we really need to read them and think about it in both lenses. Right? They're really necessary so we can understand both perspectives to fully understand and engage the gospel in its richest form. Right? So both of these, so we're going to talk about these two gospel lenses that are really needed to get us the full richness of the gospel. So let's take a look at the first lens. Lens number one is, we're going to call it the power of the gospel. And in this one, we're going to, is viewed thematically through a theme, right? We're viewing it thematically. Um, and so in this one, the power of the gospel, we see God, who is eternal, all-powerful creator. Sin, right? Sin comes in. Sin is self-rule chosen over obedience to God. Um, the penalty for sin is separation from God. We saw that in God's story, right? He kicked, he kicked folks out of the garden. Adam and Eve, he would kick his people out of their land, right? So we would see a uh, separation from God and also as a penalty is death. Then Jesus comes in, who is God incarnate, right? God in flesh, right? Came to die as a substitute for the penalty of sin. Then faith. We are saved by faith in what Jesus did and not by any accomplishment of our own, right? So here in this lens, we see the good news that God is completely aware of our sin, right? He, he knows our sin problem, and in and through the work of Jesus Christ, he accepts us and recreates us by the power of his spirit. So this is one way, you know, um, one way you can think about it is the gospel kind of on the ground, right? It's the ground level. It's the big theme of the gospel, right? It's the power of the gospel. You have God as the creator. Sin comes in. We have Jesus as God coming in flesh. And we have faith is what we trust in Jesus, the power of God that forgives us of our sins, you know, and we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is wonderful. I don't know, you know, even as Cynthia is talking about it, we should get moved just by the power of the gospel. Um, you know, I see, I see some of you guys are still caught. But this, this, this quote here, by Tim Keller. I am more broken and sinful than I ever dared believe. And at the same time, I'm more loved and accepted than I've ever dared hope because of Jesus. Wow. I mean, when you become mature and understand the Lord, you understand just how broken and sinful you are, right? I mean, when we're kind of baby Christians, we kind of think, yeah, I got things going together. You know, I'm not that bad, right? And then as you become more mature, you actually sin less, but you're more aware of your sin and how it is an affront to God. And you start to see, man, how sinful I am. But at the same time, you realize how loved I am by God and how accepted I am that he would bring me to his family because of Jesus. Now, if that don't make you rejoice and want to give him praise and thanks, you know, this is what I call doctrines that make you want to sing and dance. Right? <laughs> right? That, that, that's doctrine that makes you want to sing and dance, right? To understand just how broken you are and at the same time how loved you are by God because of Jesus. So that's that first lens, the power of the gospel. 
Now, when we look at the second lens, the purpose of the gospel is when we view it as a story, right? And this is kind of what we talk about. We view it as a story. That's the big story that runs through the Bible. It's the purpose of the gospel, and it really is creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. That's that big story, right? Here we see the good news that God sent his son to redeem the world, right, from the effects of sin and restore all people, places, and things to the way he originally created it. Rebellion, death, decay, injustice, suffering will all be removed, right? When everything is restored, God will be seen by all for who he truly is. He will be glorified. This is the kingdom of God in the fullest sense. So here we see the gospel kind of from the air, the big picture. You have God creating the cosmos and the universe, right? All of that is corrupted by the fall. So God is going to redeem all of creation. That includes human beings, but see, oftentimes we only think about human beings. But God is also going to restore creation. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, right? And right, so he's doing restoration. So all the injustice and the pain and war and all that stuff that we see in his creation will be done away with, you know, uh, in restoration. He's doing some now redemption, but there is still a longing ultimately. So you have lens one, it's kind of gospel on the ground. Lens two is kind of gospel big picture storyline, right, uh, in the air. And we really need to see the gospel in both lenses for us to really have that that rich sense of what the gospel is all about. Now, with that, having seen those two um, kind of lenses, <clears throat> which perspective on the gospel are you most familiar with? If you were, you know, kind of, whether you're growing up or even now, which lens would you say was the one that you are most familiar with? Two. Two? Really? Right. When I was growing up. Yeah. And it seemed like to me the number two helped me to um, increase my belief in the Bible mm -hmm. because it started to make sense when you look at the whole story. Oh, Christ, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Some of you said, said, said two. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm kind of with uh, Deacon Fortenberry that growing up, it was kind of like lens one. Mm -hmm. Christ died for your sins, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, trust in him or, you know, they say accept him or, you know, ask Jesus to your heart, right? Be forgiven, right? That was kind of the, the big focus. It wasn't real until later that I saw the big picture of God and the fact that God is doing something in all of creation, right? Actually, I was an adult at Mount Bryan. Okay, all right. <laughs> for, <laughs> all right, all right. First time you asked us to read the Bible in years. Mm. That was the first time I had done it. Okay, all right. You know, you go right. read through the whole Bible. Bible yeah. And yeah. then, you know, you start, I mean, you can get it out the first sure. time. Yeah, you start to make some sense and right, get right. into those that right. you're trying to get through real fast because right. you don't know what you're saying. <laughs> right. But then when you go back and read the second time, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, do it again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, it, it's something that I'm really happy that we do here on yeah. occasion and yeah. read the Bible all the way through. I'll try to get through. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also agree. I saw it through lens one. You know, mm -hmm. God, I'm a sinner. You know, right. accept, right. come and accept Jesus as your personal Savior, right. you know, right. and so forth and so on. But then when I think about, uh, as we've been learning lens two, mm -hmm. it's deeper. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it allows you to see right. the like that quote you just allowed mm -hmm. us to uh, read. You know, the sinfulness of your state. You know, before right. it's just, I'm seeing one day I'm going to heaven. Right. Without having any inclination as to what heaven's all about, <laughs> right. but it's just I'm going to right. heaven. But now a deeper respect and love for right. what Christ has truly done for all He has called us to do. Yeah, absolutely, his absolutely. Mm -hmm. So who does what? Yeah, do you have something? To say? Well, I, I guess it's interesting to me because you know, uh, when I when I, one of the things is when you talked about the your creation your own gospel story. Mm -hmm. I had a problem with that uh, until the Awakening came to rest, because mine is a story, mm -hmm. okay, you know, we, how we, we came through. And I've only got to lens one about, you know, understanding all these nuances since I came to Mount Zion. Okay. But in the beginning for me, you know, it was a story, you okay. know, and then depending on where, you know, it was 
been to her or <laughs> right. you know, Sunday school sure, or gotcha, you gotcha. Know, yeah. something on, yeah. you know, and yeah. so it was, it was okay. a story and, and, the, and, the, and okay. all the themes and everything, okay. uh, if you're going to go to hell and all this was based on the story. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. And then understanding right. all that y'all are talking about. Right. Right. It's only come about okay. what That's I'm right. trying to understand. Mm -hmm. So it's, right. it's interesting for me to. Yeah. You know, I'm the only one that you know did the other one. Okay. <laughs> and, and sometimes it's all about um, you know growing up, your background, yeah. where you came through, right? Because yeah. I'm gonna say if you grew up in the church, yeah. more than likely you were probably lens one, one very focused, is, yeah. right? Depending on what kind of church you grew up in. Now I'm hoping that yeah. you know maybe some of our kids now will actually have a better, hopefully, lens one and two. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but you're right; it really does depend on what, how you approach it, how you came into the story yeah. of God. And maybe the story was your first introduction. So absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yes, for me. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Well, good. Good. That, there's nothing right or wrong. I just know most experiences probably been maybe lens one, right? Because who or what would you say is the, does the first lens, the first perspective, uh, perspective focus on? Who would you say is kind of the focal point of lens one? God. Well, yeah, God. But, Huh? Yeah, yeah, me, us, me, right? God died for me, right? He, you know, I trusted him, I'm saved, right? This power of the gospel has changed me, right? But in the second one, who would you say is the focus on? God's a focus, but also creation, creation, right? God's, so here, in this one, this world, right? It's a, it's a bigger focus than just the individual. Because when I'm growing up, it was very, the gospel was very individualistic, right? It was kind of, it's just about me and God, right? And I didn't have a clue that God was doing some other stuff in the world, <laughs> right? It's just me, you know, God saved me, great. You know, actually God saved some other folks too, right? And he's doing some work in creation, right? So, so this one has a, a slightly different focus on his work in all of creation, right? And this is one of the things that we often kind of miss about that. And then also maybe what is our responsibility as a ref reflective of, of God's work in creation where do we maybe have some uh, responsibility to? And that's what I was going to uh, add to, too, that with, in Liz 1, I was saved. It was all about right, me. Right, right, I'm just, I'm going to heaven. heaven. Yeah, you yeah. know, it didn't it didn't reflect my purpose. Mm -hmm. Right, God right. Called the purpose me. of the gospel. Right. What a, you know, right, right. so I wasn't concerned about that. I didn't even think about it. If right. my desire was just to go to heaven. Right. But right. I see it's more than just being yeah. saved yeah, absolutely. for the purpose of saving me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. that's, that's right. Yeah, big enough. <clears throat> Well, when you were saying looking back when you're coming up, and I know we, you said which lens you look at, but you know, I, if I had chosen lens one, I would have to say it would be one. It was a, it would be a lens, but it would be one like a lens that, uh, like if you were going to have your eyes checked, mm -hmm. you find that you had cataracts. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like that. Like in growing up, you you saw things, but you didn't see it clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so. Sure. Sure. To, to yeah. me, so that's the way yeah. I looked at lens one for me is that yeah. as, as a young man, <clears throat> I understood because it was forced on me, mm -hmm. and that was <laughs> sure. saying you either yeah. do or you don't. Do. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. It wasn't right. until I became like right. Sure. Me, it's until I became an adult that when I got out and started realizing that I need to be accountable for, to to know the gospel for myself, mm -hmm. that I yeah. started learning this. The lens, yeah. seeing it more in lens two. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And sometimes, even if you were taught, like you know, say, taught lens one, maybe it wasn't quite as clear as it should have been, right? To really understand what well, is the power of the gospel, right? Uh, maybe it was more about kind of you, kind of if you do these things, God will save you, right? And so, trying to understand truly. So, we do, we all have this different, but that's why both, one, understanding both lenses, hopefully seeing them clearly, and then together, you get a richness and a deepness of the gospel so it's not distorted, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so if I can get somebody to um, read for us Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7. Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7. While you're doing that, if I, someone else, if, uh, if you want to jump ahead, get Luke 9, 1 and 2. Luke 9, 1 and 2. And also we want to look at, uh, someone else wants to grab John 20 and 21. So that's Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7, Luke 9, 1 and 2, and John 20 and verse 21. So if someone's got the Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7, read that for us nice and loud. It 
says, 29 and 4 reads, This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he had exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spi spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, pray to the Lord for it, for his we welfare will right. determine your welfare. Right. Yes. right. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. So, so in, in this passage, we're seeing that God's chosen people, Israel had really forgotten their true identity, right? They, they were to be God's representative of what he is truly like. So they were, they were supposed to reflect his glory um, in the world. They, they were his chosen people to reflect his glory, to be his living um, agents of mercy, of justice, of restoration, but here's the problem. They began to give him occasional lip service, <laughs> uh, temple attendance, while living only for themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So what did God do? God allowed Israel to be conquered and taken away into exile and slavery in Babylon. Mm -hmm. and, but even in their time of trial and discipline, God intended them to live as a blessing to their enemies. Mm -hmm. So here's the idea. Here's Israel. They're in exile. But he tells them, he says, look, this is what I'm saying to you while you're in exile, because you're going to be here a while. <laughs> Seven years. You're going to be here a while. So go ahead, build a house, settle down, produce, have family, have kids, right? Don't dwindle. We need your numbers to stay up, right? <laughs> right? Seek the peace of the city you're in, because when your city prospers, you'll prosper. Right. I need you to represent me even while you're in exile. Be an example of me even while you're in a pagan land. Yes. This, is, this is typology for even us today. Because guess what? <laughs> We're in exile. Yes. 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 This is not our home. Yes. But what does God tell us to do as Christians? We ought to look, live in the city, yes. seek yes. the good of the city. Yes. We ought to be seeking the good of Cary, of Apex, Mooresville, wherever you live, Durham, right? Seek the good, right? Have godly offspring, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to see your city prosper so you can prosper as you're in it, even in the land, even in the nation. We, we would hope that if the nation prospers, Christians will prosper, right? Mm -hmm. That's the idea. We want to be representative while we're in exile mm -hmm. until God comes and takes us home, right? So that's, this is part of this story, right? This is part of the big story. God's doing something in creation. Part of his redemption leading to restoration he wants to use his people as agents, right, for justice, for mercy, right, to be examples. This is what Israel was supposed to do, but they failed, right? So now we're going to see, someone got Luke 9, uh, 1 and 2, read that for us. Then he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all the use of slave to kill the people. Then he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God, of God and Israel. All right. Now, who is this? Who is the he? He said he in that one, right? Jesus. Jesus, right? Right. So Jesus, right now, he's calling the 12. So Jesus has come as a fulfillment of all that God intended Israel to be and do, right? Where Israel failed, Jesus fulfilled it. He came. He gave them the power and authority. He said, look, I need you to drive out demons, cure diseases. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom, right? to heal the sick, to do the things that basically he was doing. Now he's sending out his representative, mm -hmm. right? Who's got uh, John 20 and 21? Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. All right, so as the Father sent Jesus, Jesus said, now I'm sending you, right? Uh, so he, Jesus came, he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom, um, he healed the sick, he restored sight to the blind, the poor, the broken, the lost, Everyone, all needed to hear and experience the gospel of the kingdom, lived out in their midst, right? And as the church, right, we are now to live not only as the voice of God, but we are to be his hands and feet of reconciliation as well, right? We are to live out, right, this, the power of the gospel, the purpose of the gospel is for now, as Sister Thea said, it's not just about you going to heaven, but 
all right, who can I see can come along with me, right? <laughs> Am I concerned about some other folks coming along with me, right, as I, as I share the gospel, as I live in such a way that makes the gospel look beautiful and attractive, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what we are supposed to be doing, right? So this, this is kind of things that we want to make sure that we are doing in both lenses, right? Mm -hmm. And here's a problem. You will have gospel distortion, right? Um, all right, you have gospel distortion. Uh, there's a risk of distorting the gospel when we view it through only one of the two lenses. So if we view, if we view the gospel primarily as the power that sets us free, lens one, that's all we look at, we can end up focused on our own personal salvation, getting out of hell, going to heaven someday, a very human-centered gospel. However, if we view the gospel as purely focused on the restoration of all things, second lens, we can tip over the other way and believe and proclaim a social gospel. Right? This is seen in churches that are centered primarily on doing good works, acts of service, and large social projects, uh, projects in their cities, but rarely moving towards a proclamation of the gospel that includes sin, repentance, and salvation found in Christ alone. It is when we grasp and wrestle with both lenses, both perspectives, that we have a gospel that places our salvation squarely on the work of Jesus, you know, on the cross, and sends us out then as his body, his family of redemption and restoration to the world. It is when the world both hears the good news and sees a demonstration, right? They got to see a demonstration of that that they be begin to be inclined to believe, right? This is a big gospel. The gospel of the kingdom that Jesus was talking about. So when we re repent of our sin and receive the new life Jesus has offered us, we begin a journey of restoration inside and out. And not just for us, right? But for the entire world. We are now called to both proclaim the good news and to demonstrate it, right? So if you only have one lens, Lens one, it almost becomes focused on you, human centered. As long as I'm saved, I got my get out of hell free card. I ain't worried about nobody else, right? Um, but, but if you just all lens two, restoring, 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 then, and you forget to kind of proclaim the good power of the gospel, then you got a social gospel, which is feeding people's bellies and helping give them the money and restoration. But if you don't tell them about the goodness of God, they'll be well fed while they go to hell, right? <laughs> Yeah, so so we need both, right. right? You need both lenses, right? You need the power of the gospel. You need to proclaim that good news to others while also seeking the good of the city, right? Right. That, that that's very important, and that's why we get from Second Corinthians five seventeen to nineteen. It says God in Jesus Christ has given us both the message, lens one, right, of reconciliation and the ministry, lens two of reconciliation, right? We've got the message we need to proclaim, and we also have the ministry, right? So that means that we also do things to demonstrate the goodness of the gospel, right? And that's, 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 good. that's the good news that's being lived out, right? That's exactly what we want to do. All right, any comments, questions? Now, here's the thing. Sometimes we swing between message and ministry depending on the circumstance or the environment we're in, right? Um, so we got to ask ourselves, you know, how, what, you know, what do you most naturally gravitate to? Talking about the message of the good news, right? and, you know, the, the good news about Jesus, that's proclamation, or serving others as a display of a gospel demonstration, right? So you got proclamation and you got demonstration. And sometimes we swing on one side a little more heavily than the other, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I want you, as a little exercise, so I hope you got your papers, you got your notebooks, right? Uh, we got some paper and pencils over here if you need them. Um, so you're going to write down on your paper. So proclamation, and then demonstration. going to have kind of this line, right, this uh, this, this kind of spectrum, 
right? And I want you, we want what you want to do for just a few minutes is put an X on the line to evaluate for each situation I'm gonna give you, where are you most often on this scale, right? Are you more proclamation? Would you put yourself on in, in this, in, you know, depending on the situation I give or more demonstration? So, uh, for the pastor, for yeah. The the proclamation is lens moment. You look at yourself. Yeah. The demonstration is what we know as the social. Yeah, gospel, yeah. You're doing, yeah, where you're, you're doing work doing and stuff. out there. Doing good works, right. Okay. Right. But you know, you're not really you're not, not saying anything, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Got it. Right. Thank you. All right. So when it comes to, so the first one is evaluate yourself when it comes with your coworkers. With your coworkers. So with your coworkers, where would you say? You more <coughs> lean towards? Are you more talkative with your coworkers? Your proclamation, or you do you? Are you more like I gotta just serve them, you know? Because some people are like, well, yeah, that's how I should have gospel. I just live my life, right? You know, uh, is that you? Is that how you, you know? Is that is that what you say you are with your coworkers? And honestly, assess yourself, right? Next category with your neighbors. With your neighbors, how would you say? You would evaluate yourself with your neighbors. Where you lean towards, you know. Proclamation, demonstration. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who's your neighbor, right? Almost anyone you can come in contact with. But you can we may think maybe those who you know live in your, your neighborhood. How about your family? Others in your family. Right? It could be your immediate family, it could be extended family, right? How do you kind of swing on this? Do you proclamation the family, you know, or demonstration with them? These are the categories. How about other Christians? Because now, remember, Christians need the gospel too, <laughs> right? We don't need to just, you know, we, we, we talked about that. We need, Christians need to hear the gospel quite often, right? To be a reminder, right? So, but how do you, how do you kind of relate to that? Are you serving other Christians, whether it's in this church or outside, right? So just as an honest assessment for you kind of think, right? Now, obviously, we, we all hope, <laughs> right? You all hope that we're kind of in the ear, right? You want to be kind of in the middle. You want to feel like, hey, I'm proclaiming and I'm also living it out. But sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes we're, we're fearful, so we're, we may be over here. Well, I just go do good, but I don't ever kind of open my mouth, right? Or you could be and say, hey, man, I don't have no problem telling everybody about Jesus, but I'm not really helping, I'm not really serving, I'm not doing anything right. Yeah, so I'm talking a lot, but I'm not demonstrating it right. Yeah. So the strategy of doing demonstration so that you can put yourself in a position to do proclamation. Yeah. yeah. That's quite often. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. we use that as a strategy. Like, it's the warning yeah. is if you yeah. do that, make sure you don't make sure you don't right. forget the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you don't forget right. Right. So as churches do as say that churches use that as a strategy, we say, hey, we generally care for people, so we want to do good for our city. So we want to um let's say like we had the community the food distribution, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, they told us we weren't supposed to be able to put up a force people to come talk to them, right? But, all right, you know, we can't say, well, you got to talk to someone before you get your food, right? They say, you can't do that. <laughs> so, all right, can, uh, different than Convoy, Convoy of Hope, they actually have you go through, you, right. you know, and so, well, you didn't have to talk to someone, but you had to go through at least to uh, get some information. So I thought that was cool. Uh, but, yeah, they told us we could do it. But it didn't stop us from at least engaging and talking with people while they were in line, afterwards, taking them to the cars, and we had several people who would talk to people about their faith and stuff. So the idea is while we're giving food out, mm -hmm. right, that's serving our city, caring for them, hoping that they would be restored, you know, the caring about the poor, the less fortunate, let's not forget now to also proclaim it, right? Because right. if we only do the social, people really won't know, oh, well, that's a very nice church. <laughs> or that's a real nice, you know, I, Jay is so nice, he observes, man, this, that tall guy named Bobby, he's so nice. You know, he does good things, you know. But why is he nice like that? Well, it's the power of the gospel. 
but ultimately he have changed me. This is why I do good things. Right? You know, so we got to have both, right? We want to have a good balance, but right. Sometimes we just, depending on your personality, sometimes we're fearful. We don't know what to say, right? Uh, and some of us need to be, some of us are not fearful. We, we can talk a lot, but we might need to really demonstrate, you know, we want to make sure that, that, that our actions fall in line with what we're proclaiming too, right? <laughs> yeah, more said than nothing. Exactly, exactly. So, so we definitely want to make sure. So, just an honest assessment for where do you see yourself at, right? Because unless we do that, um, we don't, you know, we'll fall prey to one lens or the other, and we'll have a distorted view of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, why don't you find like a, I guess a subtlety? Because I guess for me. Uh, if I sit at my desk and eat my lunch, I'll pray with my food. Right. Or if I have a coworker that I'm pretty close to and her and I talk all the time and I'll tell her about things at, the, at church or if I want to invite somebody to church or something. So just, I guess, it's doing a little bit of both. I guess it's kind of the subtlety, but not really proclaiming, like, you need Jesus, but not uh, not also being, like, a mean person. You know right, what right, I mean? right, 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 right. Yeah, you don't have to be overbearing. Mm -hmm. uh, but the proclamation is, if you're talking about, um, say, stuff at church, right? You can you be like, man, we had, you know, we were doing this at church, and um, you know, one of the reasons we like to do stuff at our church is to serve people because we realize how Jesus served us. You know, He came, He died for for sin, our sins, and sinners, right? And because He died and He rose, that really propels us to really want to tell others and serve others. Right there, you just gave the person the gospel message, mm -hmm. right? Now you haven't done the whole. You know, you need to, you know, where are you at, right? You haven't done it like you need to respond to it. But you have proclaimed it in a way, in natural conversation. They've now heard the gospel, right? So this is how we got to think about it, right? Even in those subtleties as to why are you, you know, why am I praying over my family? When you get those discussion times, you can bring the gospel in, right? Very subtly in the conversation, right? Talk about good, to a point where you get comfortable and you can't get to that, Hey, have you ever thought about it? Yeah. How about you? You know, you know, we've we, you know, we've we've talked for maybe several months, or we've worked together for a couple of years now. And you know, I love you enough to just to see where's your relationship with God. You know, you can get to that level, but I think subtly, you know, don't think that that's not proclamation. Mm -hmm. Even as you talk about stuff, activities that you can bring up about Christ's death, His resurrection, how He saved you, you know, what He done. In, in the midst of that, that's some proclamation there. Yeah. It's a very subtle, nice, natural conversation, yeah. right? Without, you know, without being a Bible thumper yeah. at work, right? Yeah. Oh, here she come. <laughs> I'm coming. Y'all heathens ain't praying over your lunch. <laughs> right? Right? Nobody want to eat with you. Nobody want to eat with you, right? You know, because and so therefore you lost any type of proclamation. Nobody wants to get time with you, right? So you you want to be able to subtly share, right? Subtly share, right? Um, and to the point where, and then um, your life is lived in such a way that people are not surprised. You know, <laughs> we we lost, well not lost, but he took another job, a guy on our on our on our, on our job, in my team, at work, and I've never met him in person, so he's a remote worker, right? So we're always communicating, you know, video conferencing, uh, chatting over Slack or something, right? And uh, so he's leaving, and then he tried to try to connect with me on LinkedIn, right? So he saw I was a pastor, right? And so he sent me a private message. He was like, I didn't know you were a minister, but it actually makes sense now based on some conversations we've had, right? Because he's asked me some things about how do you handle the pressures of job and stuff like that, right? Because I, I don't ever see you losing your cool, right? I'm about to lose my stuff, right? <laughs> and so he says, you always, when I'm looking at a video screen, you know, everybody else is getting upset. You're just kind of cool and collected, right? So I would share some stuff with him. So when he found out, Pastor, he went like, man, I'm like, you a pastor? Are you a minister? No, he wasn't. He's like, that makes sense now, right? So you're hoping <laughs> that your life is demonstrating so that when they see, you know, when it comes very clear, those things, it, it, they're not shocked by it, right? So very subtle ways that you can bring those things in. So good. <laughs> what, about, what about approaching coworkers that, you know, are trying to work your nerves? Trying to work your nerves, yeah. That becomes the biggest one. And, and you know, you got to spend time. You got to show them love. That's probably one of the ways you break down uh, people who are who get on your nerve is to show them unconditional love, right? It's either going to do one or two things, right? It's either going to, they'll, they'll start through the love of God demonstrated through you, through us. Either it's going to melt them, right? Or it'll harden. The same sun that melts the 
the eyes can harden the clay, right? And so, you know, some people will they'll bristle against that, right? So you give as much as you can, right? Claim the love, love them as much as you can, right? Yeah. And sometimes you do. You just gotta kind of move on if they're not. But if you're not at least trying to show them some love, some unconditional love, even when they know they're, you know, sometimes we got coworkers that try their best to <laughs> get on your nerve, right? They kind of know, right? And some of them might know you're a Christian and, and try their best, right, to do that, right? So, but our responses and even our love towards them to do something when they don't deserve to have it, right? And then you can tell them, look, bro, you know, I know, you know, I covered your shift. I, you don't deserve it, right? The way you, the way you treat me all the time. But you know what? I love Jesus. And, 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 and that, that love compels me to, to help you out in your time. If you, you needed some help, you can ask for someone to cover for you, for your family, whatever, right? And that's why I did, right? I mean, you can use those subtle ways. To, but that, that, that's, that, that's the big challenge, right? All of us can talk to folks that are agreeable and nice to us, right? It becomes a big challenge when we have to love our enemies, right? Give them God, I look at them and just say, God just bless you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> And if you don't how to say it, you God just saved your life. <laughs> yeah, it depends on how you say it. <laughs> but yeah, that becomes how we live it out, really, in our jobs. And we're always asking the Lord. That should be our prayers, guys. Right? I mean, when we talk about going to our jobs, I know, I know God, we want to work into the Lord, and it can be a source of income, right? But you really got to think about it. I got to do well. That's my city. And I want that job. And I want to seek the welfare to do well. I want to work as unto the Lord. But at the same time, I'm asking, Lord, give me an opportunity today, this week. Give me boldness, right? Don't let me miss an opportunity to not only demonstrate it, but even to proclaim it in some way. Can't. I, was just, I was thinking, you know, I work with a, um, a woman who was a hood Real nice person. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I was, she will not, if you even mention Christ, mm -hmm. she walks away. Walks away, yeah. Or it's because we were doing something and I said something about Christmas and he said, oh, I can't oh, well, listen to that. Yeah, for that, yeah. You know, and little, so so she's, she throws little subtle things like we'll talk about different things and she'll, like, and she'll say, well, I'm going to Bible study. I said, well, I've been to Bible study and da 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 da, da you know, and she, yeah. but you have to cut it off at a point because she'll, yeah. well, she'll cut it off. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. What you may want to do is is get her talking because one of the things I find about Jehovah's Witnesses is that they'll love to talk to you <laughs> about <laughs> about Jehovah, about Jesus. But yeah, they're not gonna you know they'll invite you to the King's Hall or whatever. Uh, they're not gonna come to you to church, right? Uh, but maybe just start to say, well, you know, I mentioned Jesus. You know, um, what do you understand about? Jesus? Tell me about Jesus, right? And maybe see we you know just to get her to talking. And even asking questions to say, is that really what the Bible, you know, just, you know, just get some conversation going. Because she'll cut it off when you kind of initiate. But if you ask her about it, maybe she might talk a little more to get some conversation so you can do that gospel listening, right, that we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. Anyone else? Did you have to? Yeah. Oh, you can answer my question. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. You can put it out there. Yeah. And then if. Hard you just walk away. Yeah, sometimes you can. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's the boss. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, when she brought up about the Jehovah Witness, I have a neighbor that next door to me. She's Jehovah Witness to me. And so when I talk to her, I try to, I start off, I start <laughs> off with something common that, you know, yeah. she knows I've been sick and she knows, I, yeah. and I'll just tell her, that's oh. Good God, it's good. I mean, right, right. Good, uh, we, and I use that health issue because yeah. that's common for them. Sure. You know, sure. even for Jehovah's Witness, yeah. that, that's a common subject to them. So yeah. that's how I. Yeah, you, know, you find a commonality to try to get yeah. in the conversation. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so that that's a good way to try to yeah find where's the common ground, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to even, even get into the conversation, be able to mm -hmm. talk to them. Yeah, very good, very good. All right, so the gospel. It's not just about my individual happiness or God's plan for my life. It is about God's plan for the world, right? We need a bigger scope, right? And Jesus helped to really clarify how we accomplish the ultimate why of the gospel, right? The restoration of all things by giving us his mission. And his mission, we know, Matthew 28, uh, 19, go and make disciples, right? 
So as the arts, industry, politics, families, all areas of culture are increasingly filled with Jesus' disciples, we need, we need Christ followers, we need Christians in really every, a lot of, all the spheres, right, in society, you know, to, to help bring about gospel restoration. We need, we need Christian, real Christian politicians. We need Christian artists. We need Christian, you know, in industry, you know, entrepreneurs, right? The earth is, is beginning to get filled with his glory, right? And, and that's really the point of the restoration of all things, right? God's going to eventually accomplish it. We're not going to do it in our own power. Uh, but he's sending us out, right, into these areas so that God will be glorified. And discipleship really is the only mission that Jesus gave his church, right? It's got to be around discipleship. And it is how the gospel goes out, multiplies, and accomplishes the restoration of all things. So how does this work? Maybe some practical level. Um, somebody can read for us John 8, 31 and 32. John 8, 31 and 32. For Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. All right. So there were some Jews that had believed. They believed him. So it really does indicate that, you know, some had paid attention to Jesus' word. But because of the way he talks in the rest of those verses, they hadn't really necessarily committed themselves to him personally. You see, it is possible to believe, I put those in quotes, right, in the message of repentance <coughs> and the coming kingdom without being born again, right? So it's possible for folks to make a, pro a profession and say they believe without actually being born again, but without actually being a Christian. And really, the true sign of that is continuing in the truth, right? Continuing in the truth is a sign of true followers and learners, disciples of, of Christ, right? If they really grasp the message, they would find a salvation truth, and knowing the salvation truth would liberate them from the bondage to sin, right? So when you know and receive the message and you stay in the truth, right, it sets you free, right? You're free from the bondage of sin. Um, but some people, it takes a while to get them there, right? Some people may quickly say, yeah, that makes sense, I, you know, but they haven't really committed, they haven't been born again. So what does this mean? This means that we may need to spend some time with people so that they will grasp the truth that we are proclaiming and demonstrating so that the truth will set them free, right? We need to, we need to think about how do we invest time with people so that they will come to understand the truth that we're proclaiming and demonstrating, right? Think about Jesus. Jesus spent years with his disciples, and none of whom were Christians at first, right? Leading them to walk in his way and obey his teachings. Then over time, they came to believe the truth about who he was, and they were set free, right? There was a lot of times when they didn't know what, and then they were, they were starting to be revealed, right? Him walking on the water. They were like, what manner of man is this? <laughs> yeah. He would talk to the wind, you know, storm, peace, be still, like what kind of, you control the weather, right? So they hadn't gotten quite there yet, but they were sticking around, <clears throat> him, right, right? So we should invite others to walk with us as we are living our everyday lives as his disciples so they can see what it means to walk in the way of Jesus, right? So there's an opportunity for us, right? So in this way, we actually disciple others to Christ, right? As we encounter unbelievers, we invite them into your life, right? Spend time with them. They see you. They interact with you. They see you demonstrating. They can hear you talk about the good news and proclaim it, right? They, they begin, and so you're now discipling them. So part of discipleship includes evangelism, right? You're discipling them to Christ, right? This is how they will come to believe the gospel that we proclaim and demonstrate, by participating in his life and community where they can repeatedly see and hear the gospel as it comes into contact and contrast with their lives, right? See, they'll see something different. That's the key, right? They got to see something and hear something different that's different from their lives, right? So in some sense, they will come to belong before they believe. And when I say that, they belong not, not to the church, 
or to the body of Christ, but they actually belong to kind of the community, right? They kind of hang out. Have you ever, I don't know if you've ever seen, sometimes there are people that love to be around Christians, you know, they'll come to church, very often. they haven't trusted Christ yet, but there's just something about them, right? There's something, I like being around them, uh, there's something different about them, right? But then over time, right, God will use that demonstration and proclamation to grant them the faith to believe. So the question is, what are we doing to invite people, right? See, all your friends, all your, you know, all your friends should not all be Christian. Really, you should, you should, you should need to know and have some, some, some social, some, I'm not saying, they don't have to be bosom buddies, but they, you need to be somebody that doesn't know the Lord, right? Because if you're all just hanging out with Christians all the time, you know, you need to be expanding, right, so that you can be a, proclamation and demonstration of the gospel right so here's the question for you to really ponder and ask yourself right what could you more intentionally invite who could you more intentionally invite to walk in the ways of Jesus with you in normal everyday life who could you invite to kind of go in life with you that you know that may not know the Lord right you know and then think about this what regular parts of your day or week could easily be done with someone else that you are, say, trying to disciple to Christ, right? So think about times that you're already doing stuff, right? We're not talking about spending more time doing something else, but <coughs> invite them to do that with you, right? If you're going shopping, maybe invite a non-believing friend to go shopping with you, right? All right, so those of you that like to shop, you got a shopping button, right? <laughs> but at the same time, you're not going spinning overboard because guess what? Shopping is not your idol, right? So you make sure you demonstrate that, right? <laughs> right? So, but, but you're doing these things anyway, right? Or if you have a family, you're married, you may extend an invitation to another couple that don't know the Lord, right? You know, if you got single friends, right? You're going out, you're hanging out, you're doing something. Hey, come out, you know, we're doing this, come with us. Hey, our church is doing this project is so invite non-believing friends to say a lot of them would love to do service projects it's not, that's not a that's not an issue right you know i mean ibm always is doing service projects all the time you know this you know. so if we were doing something and you had some non-believing hey our church is doing this come along and you hope it, that in the context of them they see christians serving but at the same time maybe getting some conversation or proclamation is happening right maybe you, if you're inviting other folks to your house right for an event going on, invite some non-believing, some of your neighbors to come over while you got Christian friends coming over, right? So then they can interact as well. So think about those ways. What are ways that you can do to invite so that maybe you can disciple them to Christ, right? While you're doing it. And so we're not talking about doing other things, additional things, but doing things that you're already, already doing. Okay. So I want you to consider this. Um, Somebody get Matthew 11, 28 through 30. And read that for us. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are labor, who are labor and I'm sorry. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy. You know, our lives as disciples who make disciples really should not be a burden. Right? The life in Christ, when it's living out our recreated identity, should fill us with peace, joy, and great contentment. So if you're feeling that your Christian life, your ministry, your life in community is a heavy load, then it's not Jesus' load you're carrying. Because he said, come to me. You're heavy load me. If you're bearing down and you try, maybe you're trying to do it in your own strength, or you're trying to earn something. Jesus said, No, 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 no. If you're tired, you're worn out, you're burned out on man-made religion, okay, we make Christianity the man made I gotta do these things to earn favor with God. No, he says, Come to me. Get rest. Right. Uh, rest in his completed work. We don't have to earn anything, right? So even when we're talking about doing this, this we don't this is not talking about this to be a burden. Nah. Now nah, I gotta go share my faith. You know, oh, this is such a burden. No, we're not. Man, if that's the case, you can go back to sit at the feet of Jesus. Right? It should be a joy to be able to share with somebody else. Now you might need to pray for some boldness 
and help you overcome any fear, you know, those things, because sometimes we naturally have that. And then there's no pressure on you. Guess what? You can't save anyone, right? So it is Jesus who will make disciples of us, all of us, right? We're only called to walk along with him in loving obedience, right? So his burden, there is a little bit of a burden. I mean, there's, you know, he says there's, there's something for us to do, but it's light, right? It should not be so burdensome, right? So any questions, comments? Homework. Homework. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think one of the things you said, one important thing you said, the, the examples you kept giving were you kind of invited them to your turf. So in other words, if you had like a non-Christian friend yeah. and they wanted to do certain things, right? Like they want to go to the bar, right, right, right. You wouldn't necessarily be yeah. with them at the bar, right? So I'm like, you know, don't, <laughs> yeah, don't <laughs> flow into a temptation, there right? By trying to help somebody else, you know, yeah, absolutely. Kind of invite them to your turf, like you said. Yeah, yeah. Things Most you do. Things I'm doing. Right. If right. those aren't things you usually do. Right, right. <laughs> right, absolutely, absolutely. So if you know, especially you know that's if that's a temptation area or something like that, don't you know, don't don't do that. I know Jesus spent time with sinners, but you know, we, that doesn't mean that he indulged in what they were doing, right? You know, he ate with them. I mean, so if someone says, Hey, hey man, I'm going out to the bar. We we've been hanging out, come out and hang out. You know, now, the bar's not my scene, but you know what? Hey, let's go for coffee tomorrow or in the morning because you might need some coffee in the morning. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll treat you to breakfast. You know, I mean, there's something like that, right? You can easily say, you know, that's not really my scene. I, you know, you know, you know, hey, man, we got, we just got paid. We're going to the strip club. Nah, I'm going to keep a dollar. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, Pastor, I was just also uh, looking at, as you mature and grow, you begin to think about, I can remember when I was, someone, even in the church that was a new member, someone was coming at you, uh, I'm having problems here, or can you, yeah. uh, can you and, and the first thing you would do is say, uh, let me, let me, uh, why don't you go to Bible study, mm -hmm. uh, you point them to some other direction, mm -hmm. or and I think the when you when you really have it in you to to serve God and do things other than when they come to you and say, Hey, look, I'm having a problem uh, understanding uh, the Bible or how to study it, that's that's your opening to say, Let's let's get together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. You know, and then you set it and say, We're gonna do it and then I think you find you find that they reciprocate more and then when they yeah. come they're more sincere and it's amazing how People put themselves out yeah. when they see that you're yeah. committed and, and helping them to grow. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Instead of them feeling like you're just tossing me aside, right? You know, and even if you say, hey, I don't feel comfortable with whatever they're requesting, you just you can be like, hey, hey, why don't we go to Bible study together? You know, don't just send me out to Bible study. Hey, come. Hey, I'll, you know, I'll wait for you. If you come to church, I'll be at the front door, you know, and we'll walk in together and we can talk about what we did, you know, what the study was on, right? You know, what, you know, and so, or if, you, if you're like, well, I just don't know if I'm comfortable with whatever they're asking. The point is go with them, spend time with them. Don't just say, hey, just go to Bible study, you know. Don't, don't bother. <laughs> They'll feel like, you, you know, you don't want them to bother with you, right? You just toss them off on someone else. So, yeah, sacrificing some time and the things you're normally doing and invite them in, you know, making sure if they come to you, maybe that's the reason why, why they came to you, right? right? And, and so you want to make sure that you're taking advantage of that opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, homework. All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to look for things this week that are not in line with God's original plans for people and this world. So I want you to look around and your environment, um, I want you to write down five things that you saw as you were looking throughout this week that are broken, so to speak, that you, and maybe even others, right? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna think, I'm getting paparazzi taking pictures of you. <laughs> <laughs> I know y'all taking pictures of this, right? But I'm just feeling very popular right now. <laughs> uh, write down five things that you saw that are broken that you and maybe even others can take part in restoring and display the gospel, right? Uh, so these are just some examples, right? Look around maybe in your neighborhood or, or in places you know. Is there an elderly person's home or yard that needs some help? 
right? It's starting to get warm, right? Things of that nature. Is there a park or public space that needs some love, right? Uh, and it's not saying that you have to do it yourself. Maybe you partner up with some people and say, hey, you know, I saw this in our community that, man, no one's really neglected this little playground, right? Kids don't have anything. And come in there and say, hey, we want to spruce this up, right? We're doing this because we're Christians, we love the Lord, and we want to serve, you know, at, right? Uh, neighbor's fence or neighbor, something that's going on, right? You know, don't just fight with your neighbors. Look for ways to serve them, right? You know, kids that need mentoring. Maybe you got a struggling coworker or friend, right? Maybe there's someone that needs a babysitter. They're a single mom and they're really struggling, right? Uh, people who seem lonely or discarded, right? What are some things? So I want you to really think, right? Because if you're like me, I'm going to be honest. Sometimes you go through your week, you're narrow focus, right? You're narrow focus, right? I'm going to my job. I need to get this taken care of. I don't see nobody. I don't bother nobody. Don't bother me, right? You know, it just kind of... You know, I don't see what my neighbors are doing, right? You know, uh, uh, co-workers, I'm just kind of doing my job, going home, you know, and re repeat the cycle, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes we need to take some time to look around and see where's the opportunities God may give us to actually be a demonstration so that we can do a proclamation. So I realize, so I want you, so come back next week now, and I want to hear some ideas, right? And it could be some things that maybe we as a church could do, right? Uh, but don't just depend on the church. Maybe some things God's calling you to do. Look in your neighborhood, you know. Look at your job. Look at those places, right? Really think about what what do you see that's not quite where God's going to use me to do the, be the good in my city, right? To really use to help towards that part of that restoration. But God has me, you know, um, care for your city, right? We're in exile, but we want to we want to do the good of the city, right? So that it will prosper, um, prosper, especially prosper in the Lord. All right. All right. All right, good stuff. Questions, comments before we get ready to go? All right, good. So keep practicing your, your gospel stories, God's story, your gospel story. And be on the lookout, at least for five things that you may see. Uh, that can be a good opportunity for, for you to uh, show some love, show where you can work or, or partner with others, right? We're, we're not in this by ourselves, so that's a nice thing, too. You can feel overwhelmed, but, you know, there could be opportunities for you to do um, or do something cool together with other people. All right. All right, well, we'll come up, we'll pray. All right, any prayer requests? Uh, Sister Barbara Smith, she had surgery on her hand, um, so just praying for her recovery. Jackie, yeah, Jackie, mm -hmm. yeah, she's back. She's right back home, uh, so she's recovering. So keep praying. Keep her recovery prayer. Jackie, Kevin, Kevin. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, Jackie. How's Ron doing? He's doing better today. Oh, okay. First of all, Father, we give you thanks and praise yes. as we think about that first lens, God. We think about how sinful we are yes. and think about how glorious good you are to save wretched sinners like us. God, yes. Lord, thank you, Lord. Thank, thank, you, Lord. thank you that the power of the gospel will save us from the penalty of our yes. sins and you would yes. fill us with your spirit, God. Yes. And you, would, you would give us the joy, yes. Lord, of knowing that we are in your family, that we are loved by you. God, thank you, Lord. And I pray that 
that joy would not just uh, yes. end with us, God, yes. that we would have that second lens, Lord, mm -hmm. to go out and to demonstrate it, to proclaim it to other people, God, yes. that we would be a visible demonstration of the power yes. of the gospel, yes. Lord, that we would proclaim it to those that we come across. Yes. So, God, I pray, Lord, for all of us to give us eyes to see where we can Please, help God. someone that's hurting, yes. help a neighbor, help a coworker, yes. someone that is in need to know yes. that God yes. loves them, that yes. Jesus died for sinners, God. So, Lord, I pray that you give us eyes and ears to Please, really God. hear and see what is going on around us yes. so that we can be the, the messengers of reconciliation, God, oh, yes. that we can be the agents and the ambassadors that you're calling us to be, Lord. And God, we want to pray for those requests that have come forward, Lord. Yes. Pray for those who have surgery that's coming yes. up, God. Pray for those who've had surgery, God. Yes. Give, bless the surgeons, Lord. Bless that you would heal them but even before they go in, Lord. May the surgery be a success, God. Bless those who are traveling to be with loved ones, Lord. Give them safety and traveling mercies, God. God, we pray for recovery for those who've been in the hospital, who've been sick, God. We pray for those who've got a diagnosis of cancer, God. We pray for their healing, God. We pray for your mercy upon their lives, God. God, you are such a good God. You have the final say-so, God. So we ask your blessing upon them right now in the name of Jesus, God. So, God, we just thank you and praise you for your goodness, God. And, God, for every request that have been mentioned and maybe those that have not been mentioned, God, see about them, Lord, according to your will. God, you are yes. so good. Oh, and I pray yes, that as we leave this place, until we gather again, yes. send us out as your agents. Please, yes. As the Father, as you, Father, has sent Jesus, yes. Lord, we know Jesus is sending us oh, to yes, be Lord. your disciples, yes. to be disciple makers, God. Yes. So embolden us, give Please, us the power God. of your Holy Spirit yes, to be your witnesses, oh, Lord, yes. in our hometown, yes. in the surrounding areas, yes, and Lord, even Jesus to the utmost parts of the world. And God, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.